seven o'clock. <laughs> All right, well, I guess I'll, I'll get started with my introduction and I'm sure people will continue to trickle in as we get started here. So hi everyone, uh, thanks again for joining us for another virtual CanGeo talk. My name is Alex, I'm the digital editor at Canadian Geographic Magazine and I'm here with tonight's speaker, Ray Zahab, who I'm gonna introduce to you in just a moment. Uh, I do have some announcements before we get going about some cool stuff that is happening in the next couple of weeks that you may not know about yet. Um, so first of all, if you missed our first virtual talk with RCGS Explorer in Residence, Jill Heinerth, you can still check that out on our YouTube channel. It was an absolutely fascinating hour filled with amazing stories and photos from Jill's diving expeditions around the world. So definitely check that out. It was really cool. And if you are on Twitter and you're into gardening or you're thinking about getting into gardening now that the weather's getting nice, uh, definitely you're going to want to pop on Twitter tomorrow, Friday, uh, at 12.30 p.m. Eastern. So over the lunch hour, if you live in the Eastern time zone, and we're going to be hosting a live Twitter Q&A with gardening expert Mark Cullen and his son Ben. So they're going to be there taking all of your questions about, um, you know, how to get started with gardening, how to work with your space if you don't have a huge yard or if you've got some tricky light happening. Um, definitely check that out 12.30 p.m. Eastern tomorrow for the gardening Q&A with Mark Cullen and his son Ben. And then next week, uh, we're gonna be doing another edition of CanGeo Virtual Trivia. So if you missed this last week, let me tell you, it is so much fun. It's hosted by our social media editor, Angelica Haggart. She has dozens of questions that are really gonna challenge your knowledge of Canadian geography and wildlife. So gather your household, gather the kids, get your favorite pub snacks, get some chicken wings going <laughs> and join us for live CanGeo Virtual Trivia also right here on YouTube. And that's at 7 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday, May 19th. So definitely you don't wanna miss that. Uh, one more cool thing to tell you about before we get started and I hand the floor to Ray, is that if you are not yet a subscriber to Canadian Geographic Magazine, but you're thinking about it and you'd like to you know, get a sense of what else we do, we have a special deal for you tonight, a promo code that you can use to get 30% off a one-year subscription. So all you have to do to take advantage of that is go to cangeo.ca slash subscribe and enter the promo code RayZ30 to get 30% off that one-year subscription. So it's just for you folks watching tonight as a, our way of thanking you for tuning in to another one of our virtual events. Um, Angelica is gonna drop that link and that promo code in the chat, if you're watching, uh, definitely take advantage. It means that you'll get mail. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I've been super excited to get all kinds of mail during this uh, self-isolation period. So, and you'll be getting a really quality magazine with great stories and featuring great people like Ray. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Ray. Um, he is an adventurer. He's an ultra marathoner. He has run more than my brain can even process uh, in all kinds of insane environments around the world. And he's also an explorer in residence of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. Um, if you're listening and you have a question for Ray, definitely drop it in that chat. We're gonna do a little Q&A at the end, but for now, uh, take it away, Ray. Well, thank you, Alex. It's so great to be here. And uh, I mean, the virtual, doing this whole virtual thing, because we had originally, so I was going to be speaking at the RCGS on, on Sussex. And then, of course, you know, with the current situation with the COVID pandemic, you guys came up with this. And I just think it's so awesome. And I saw Jill's talk, part of Jill's talk last week. It was awesome. And I'm really stoked to be part of this day. So I thought what I would do, okay, so without messing this up, because I'm not a Zoom expert, but I am going to share my screen and go to some photos for a while. Um, let me just do this very quickly. And can everybody see that? Can you see that? Not yet. Let's <laughs> see. Uh, try again, it says. Hang on one second. Let me see. Can you see now? Nope. Okay, hang on a minute. Share screen. We have the technology. 
Share there. of that. Perfect. Can we see that? <laughs> yes. Awesome. See, this is what makes it so much fun, Alex. You know? <laughs> so uh, everyone out there, so I am an explorer in residence, obviously, with the RCGS, very proudly so. And when people first hear uh, that I'm an adventurer, they assume that I must be some sort of climber or, um, you know, somebody that does these sort of alpine type activities. And it's, it's really not what I do. I'm in fact, more of an ultra runner. I do these horizontal expeditions. So my goal is to cross large geographies on the planet. As a matter of fact, to this point, I've crossed close to 17,000 kilometers on foot across deserts and cold regions of the planet. And I connect my expeditions as live as I possibly can using satellite with schools all over the world, with living rooms all over the world. I try to bring the locations that I'm in uh, to your computer screen. That's always my goal, share the places that I'm in. Now, when I'm doing these expeditions, obviously there's two modes of transport for me. One of them is a supported type expedition. So by supported, it means someone out there at some point is gonna give me some water or some food because literally it's just too hard to cross a very hot desert like this one that you see. This is the Namib Desert. Um, I ran 1,850 kilometers from the South African border to the Angolan border in the middle of summer. Trust me, it's very hot. And about the longest I could go, and I've calculated this over time, crossing you know, sand dunes and salt flats and mountains and whatever is about 30 to 50 kilometers without a resupply in 50 degree heat. So I've got my backpack on there and I am leaving what I call like my checkpoint. My water has been reloaded into my backpack by my buddy, John Golden, who took this photo, who is a professional photographer. And he's made sure that I got everything I need and then off I go. Henceforth, I have support. And now I'm going to navigate my way across these sand dunes and carry on across the Namib Desert. In stark contrast is being on an Arctic expedition. So whether I'm solo or with a teammate like this in this photo from the Kamchatka Peninsula in Far East Russia, this photo was taken in winter 2019. That's my Italian teammate, Stefano Gregoretti. And we are crossing this mountain range, which I believe was on day 18, that we were completely self-contained and unsupported. So meaning everything we needed to survive this frozen Russian wilderness was in those sleds, all of our food, all of our camping gear, everything, tent, everything is in there and we're pulling it with us. John, incidentally, same guy that took the photo in Namibia, took this photo, it was the first time we'd seen him uh, in those 18 days. And so we were totally stoked that he was standing at the top of this mountain and we could see him from miles away, right? His bright red jacket. But really it's the Arctic expeditions, it's the unsupported expeditions that do pose, I guess you could say in some ways the greatest risks, but also, uh, the greatest amount of self-sufficiency, where you're out there for the entirety of the time, relying on the years spent studying the location, learning about the place that the expedition's gonna happen, making sure you've got everything packed right, uh, making sure you've got all of the gear that you need to survive. And of course, learning how to travel in the Arctic in the middle of winter, because honestly, that's when I prefer to be up there. I love our Canadian Arctic, it is, to me, the most beautiful place on earth. And I love being there in January, February, in those times of years. So I've spent a lot of time learning from friends of mine in the Arctic about the environment and taking an appreciation for the environment before traveling through it. This is a friend of mine, Billy Arnicook from Kikik Tarjwak. And he's taught me tons about cold weather travel and spending time in the Arctic unsupported and what's important, like for example, this is a critical piece of the Arctic in winter. These are tracks that we saw one time when we were bombing across the Arctic ice on snow machines. These are polar bear tracks, as you probably have guessed. And for anyone that doesn't know or has never seen a polar bear track, these tracks are literally like the size of a seat cushion. They're huge. And the polar bear itself is the apex hunter on the planet. And it's essentially the size of a minivan, right? I mean, they're just these gigantic, beautiful animals. But they are like, this is the land of the polar bear. And I can remember one time, you know, standing there looking at these tracks with Billy and uh, another buddy of mine that was with us. And I looked at, oh my gosh, are those polar bear tracks? He said, yeah, they sure are. And I said to Billy, do you think there's any polar bears around here? And without batting an eyelash, he looked up and he said, do you see any tracks? 
And so basically the message was, listen, dummy, you're in the land of the polar bear. There's bears are everywhere and they are stealthy. So you have to appreciate the environment and the hazards that are there in the environment and also the wildlife that is the environment. This is a photo um, on Baffin Island. That's Thor Mountain in the sort of distance on the left. This photo was taken in February. As I mentioned before, there's nothing I love more than taking these expeditions and connecting them with classrooms and giving youth around the world, kids in countries all over the world, the opportunity to see the awesomeness, for example, of the Canadian Arctic in the middle of winter. The sky looks so different. Like in this video, I'm not sure if it's playing, Alex, if you can see that, but this is our, Ar this is the Canadian Arctic in minus 65 in the winds, in the winter. The sun is huge because of all the ice crystals blowing up into the atmosphere. It's just such an amazing video. By the way, it's seven seconds long and that's how long your iPhone will last in minus 65 degree wind. If you keep it warm against your body and you hold it out there, that's about how long it'll last. And so we were able to get this amazing clip and upload it um, to a website and to the, obviously to social media. And it was seen thousands, hundreds of thousands of times around the world. So people really getting an opportunity to sort of feel the Arctic as best as we could share that spot, that moment in time on that expedition. And it's not just the amazing and wonderful landscapes, it's the truly incredible people that we've met on these expeditions. Like for example, Stefano and I together ran supported. So in the case of this, this was with, with help, uh, a thousand kilometers across the Patagonian desert and crossed through the Andes mountains and a high region called the Meseta, which is still ranched today like you know, ranches of a bygone era, let's say in North America, where there were no fences and animals grazed wild, but people tended to their livestock for, you know, over tens of thousands of hectares, just a wide open, incredible land. Upon running across this Meseta area, Stefano and I were resupplying, try, setting a goal of running about 60 kilometers per day. And as we crossed over the Andes um, with the resupplies that we were willing to carry on our back that were light enough that we could still run, like in that first photo I showed from Namibia, we started to make our way across the Meseta, which is tens of thousands of hectares of rocky outcrops pockmarked with craters and depressions. And lo and behold, as we were crossing from one area or one checkpoint where, if you picture in your mind, we're in a straight line across this rocky region, our crew had to drive for several hours with four wheel drive vehicles to go a completely different route to meet us at our next GPS waypoint, because of course they could not drive where we were going. We were moving cross country. We spent the next 20 kilometers taking our time. It was oppressively hot, you know, tending to and, and monitoring the amount of water that we were drinking. And as we were making our way to our next checkpoint 20 kilometers away, Stefano and I noticed in one of these large craters far off in the distance, we could see a house. And we were like, what the heck? Why is there a house down in that giant hole in the ground? We had no idea who would want to live in a hole. But as we made our way closer and the kilometers were ticking down to the next checkpoint, this, this arbitrary GPS waypoint that through study of maps, we knew our crew could get to and meet us safely. We came up with theories of why someone would live down there. We're a kilometer and a half from our next checkpoint. And lo and behold, there's another crater off to our left. And down in this crater, this depression, was a house. And we immediately knew we had to go and visit whoever lived down in this crater. Like we had to know the story, we wanted to learn. So we called John, who was once again out there with us and took these photos and on the satellite phone and said, John, you gotta come back. Here's our waypoint. This is where we're at. You're gonna have to trek with your gear because there's no way you can get those vehicles back here, but you gotta come and meet us. He did. And he brought another buddy of mine who was doing translation for us. And we scramble down the side of this crater. We knock on this house and Roberto comes to the door and he invites us in. And immediately, I just so warmly invited us in. And I'm just thinking to myself, wow, okay, this is like totally surreal. We're standing in this man's house in the middle of this crater in the Masada in the Patagonian desert. And we're learning about his life and why these homes are built down in these depressions because the winters are so insane there. The winds are so strong that really, truly nothing would survive. 160 kilometer an hour sustained winds they get 
along the top of the masada. So it's a way of creating almost, if you will, I'm going to use the term microclimate. I know that's probably not the right term, but a protective area for their livestock and the lean tos and buildings that have been fabricated down here. And they were well protected from the elements down in these depressions. And so he, he was explaining all of this to me. He's also explained that the wood stove that was there in his home was not connected to any gas or electricity because of course there was none of that there. There was no running water. He got all of his water from the pond that was in the crater, not far from one of his buildings. But then instead he burned wood in this wood stove and it was wood that he gathered up on the Masetta throughout the summer as he ranched. He told me that the wind would blow wood up from the lowlands into the Masetta. So it was random bits of wood and he'd have these saddlebags loaded up. And over the course of the summer, he would gather enough wood to burn throughout the winter and keep warm. And he showed me this random huge pile of wood. He had just an amazing, amazing guy who was living this extraordinary life. And I went to shake his hand, Roberto's hand before we left. And his hand was like, honestly, if the dude was 80, he must have been. And his hand was like beef jerky in a hydraulic press. He had so much strength in his hand. He was like crushing my hand. And he pulled my hand to him and he noticed that I had my, my GPS on. And he said, oh, you and, your, you and your friend, I've been noticing you've been looking at your watches since you've been here. And I said, well, we got to get some more kilometers in today. And we don't want to be rude, but yeah, you know, we're looking at the time. And I said, you don't, you don't, how do you keep time? I don't see a clock. I don't see a watch. He says, listen, he goes, I sense the changes in the season. It's how I track my time. It's how I need to track time. The change of the seasons is the most important thing for me. And he was so in tune with his environment that he could, he could feel those subtle changes as they were coming. And so his day relied on when the sun rose and when it set in those seasons of change. And I just thought, this is one of the most fascinating men I've ever met. And we got to uh, very generously from him share his story with schools who followed along and with anyone who was following along with the expedition that truly it's the people that I get to meet in these far off regions of the world and share stories that really are the most compelling part of any of these expeditions that I do. My goal obviously with any expedition, whether it's a desert or, or a, a cold icy landscape is to not only you know, do as straight lines as I can, navigate cross country, be off road in the remotest area as much as I can, but also connect with the people that I'm meeting along the way and hopefully get to share their stories from the driest places or the coldest places on earth to some of the highest places. Uh, that's the goal. One of the, most, one of the most fascinating cultures actually that I had ever met uh, or came into contact with and got to share the story of was in Mongolia. So I ran the width of the, of the Gobi Desert, over 2,000 kilometers solo. I did that in summer 2013. John was there. I was resupplied minimally. So I was receiving resupplies every 20 to 30 kilometers. And I would navigate and run anywhere between 60 and 70 kilometers per day. So I was covering a lot of ground and I was spending a lot of time alone out there. You know, occasionally meeting up with people, but John and his crew where instead they'd meet me at those waypoints, at those checkpoints. They made sure I'd have everything. I'd say, I'd say, see you later, dude. And then they would go off and film these amazing stories in communities that were sometimes 100, 200 kilometers away. I literally ran through maybe three communities, but because of their hard work and effort on that we were on this expedition, they were able to capture these amazing videos that shared a very specific time in the Mongolian culture and calendar, the, the season of Nadam, where wrestlers and horse racers and archers become heroes in that country. And so by bringing great people together, like my buddy Zach, and this is Natalia Gubariva, who's uh, you know an acclaimed filmmaker, they've come together and they volunteer their time, they capture the stories, and then we upload them. Here's John, by the way. Incidentally, it's kind of a funny photo of the photographer, right? So somebody's, I, I don't know why I always find that so funny that there's a photo of the photographer. Anyhow, you know, the things that I find funny. But the websites that I create when I'm on these expeditions as well, even in Mongolia or wherever I am, sharing those stories of the people and the landscapes are also a portal, portal whereby which schools can ask me questions when I'm out there. It's a goal of mine to teach as many young people about this amazing planet as I possibly can. One of my favorite questions, it's sort of like I have this top 10 list of questions that I know I'm always going to get from students when I'm on expeditions. If I'm in a hot desert, 
as you can imagine, one of the primary questions, how hot is it in the hot desert? Like they want it to be so hot that I'm melting. And luckily I've been able to deliver on that occasionally. This is the temperature of the ground in Death Valley, California in the middle of summer. So I did a north to south, completely off-road in 2011 with my buddy, Will Laughlin. And we did a west to east just last year of Death Valley National Park. Both expeditions, middle of summer, both expeditions at the hottest time to be in Death Valley. And I'll tell you, in a place that's so hot that the rubber breaks off on the bottom of your shoes, you still see and experience amazing things. It's one of the reasons that I love the extremes. I get asked as well by students all the time, why do you go to the deserts in the middle of summer? Go in the winter when it's colder. I said, well, no, I want to be there in the summer. I want to be there when the desert is its most deserty. I want to be in the Arctic when it's the most Arctic-y in the winter, right? So here I am in Death Valley. This is a picture of a rainbow in Death Valley, not long after a thunderstorm. Now, what was so amazing about the thunderstorm, this is very close to the Badwater Basin. My buddy Will and I are on our way across. It's oppressively hot. It's raining above our heads. And yes, droplets are hitting us, but a number of those droplets are evaporating once they hit the ground or evaporating in the atmosphere because of the heat. And so you have a mix of this huge amount of humidity in the hottest place on earth in Death Valley. You have a rainbow in the distance and it smells like springtime in Chelsea, Quebec, where I live. I mean, just amazing. Another one of my favorite questions when I'm in the hot deserts that I get from young people is, what's the ground like? What's it like running in a desert? Well, this is a photo of a buddy of mine. Uh, his name is Dave. And he is providing a water resupply on one of my Death Valley trips in an area called the Devil's Golf Course. So the Devil's Golf Course is an area of salt and uh, uh, dirt that's mixed together. Dave has walked out, I can't remember how far, from a four-wheel drive vehicle and I'm coming straight at him. He's walked from the side, if you can picture. And so he looks very unhappy because as a matter of fact, I don't blame him, it's about a billion degrees out there. And he's waiting for me so that he can sort of steer me off to the side so that I can get some water, so that me and my buddies can get some water. Running on the ground in deserts is really the, one of the most difficult parts. That in Death Valley, that section, eight kilometers of the Devil's Golf Course of Salt took us eight hours to cross, one, going one kilometer per hour. This is a photo of me running through the driest place on earth, the Atacama Desert in Chile in the middle of summer. I look very tired. This is my zombie running state. I've got all of my gear with me and I'm going as far as I can between checkpoints, between 20 to 50 kilometers without resupply. So I carried a lot of stuff. It was over 50 degrees Celsius every day in the Atacama Desert, but it was the ground that made it so difficult. I mean, running on rocks like this all day takes its toll on your body. Well, it's the start of day, I think we're on day seven. And I uh, had another great day yesterday, got 70K in, uh, 40 miles. Um, but I've been nursing a blister while I've been out here. This is what it looks like. So check this out. So I'm not sure everybody can see that video. Can you see that video, Alex, of that blister? <laughs> there it so is. I'm hoping. Yeah. I'm... So there you go. So, I mean, you know, obviously there's hazards to the job, right? When you're going to run that distance every day. But the Atacama Desert was so amazing. Because it is literally the driest place on earth. I ran through sections of desert where no one had been for potentially thousands of years. And it was an honor to be in such an amazing place. At one point I ran on a section of literally the Incan Trail. I saw petroglyphs out there. I saw and ran through an area where literally practically nothing lives. And nothing, nothing by meaning no plants, no grass, no bugs, no nothing. L nothing smells a lot like cardboard, which is an interesting observation, right? So from the hottest places on earth to the coldest places on earth, students ask me questions about these places as well. And they're just as compelled about these cold places. This little video clip here is from Siberia, Lake Baikal. In Siberia, I crossed that in winter as well, unsupported. That's the sled with all the gear and everything. That's my solar panel so that I can keep the laptop charged so that I can talk with students as I make my way with my buddy Kevin, south to north across what is the clearest ice on the planet. So you can imagine connecting students to literally the most voluminous source of fresh water on the planet is Lake Baikal. You could take three, three of the big Great Lakes, the, the three great, well, all of the Great Lakes actually, I believe, and put them into 
Lake Baikal. They'll all fit inside. That's how much water is it. It's, it's over to uh, 5,000 feet deep, so 1,500 meters, you know, uh, deep in the center. It's absolutely extraordinary. And the ice is so clear that you can see fish frozen a meter down in the ice. So you almost get this vertigo when you're walking on top of it. It's, it's mind boggling. And I can remember trying to take photos of these fish with the light reflecting off the ice and explaining to students, this is what 1970s disco shoes <laughs> look like with the goldfish in them. I mean, you're looking at these fish. I don't even know how they got there. Like it's like they, one day they just froze and they were stuck there. And, and I, do they thaw out? in the spring i never did get the answer to that question and i was back over there this year and I, once again i forgot to ask the answer to that question but there you go ice fish uh, fish frozen in the ice and why did we get to see them because we chose to run 650 kilometers across lake baikal that's the beauty of adventure and being in these places is being able to share those stories of exploration you know the history of exploration around the world is an amazing thing. And I've always been so inspired by the stories of Amundsen and Shackleton. So it was truly an honor to go on expedition to the geographic South Pole. And my two friends and I spent 33 days, 23 hours and 55 minutes actually trekking unsupported self-contained from a region on Antarctica called Hercules Inlet to the geographic South Pole. I told my buddies, the, the best part about doing this expedition is we get to dress like 1980s rock stars. So I don't know if that makes any sense to anyone out there if you're my age, but this is what Motley Crue looked like in 1983, right? But all kidding aside, you can imagine being as far away from home as you can possibly be. And we are in this place where there's such a history of exploration and being able to connect the dots, telling the stories of Antarctic exploration with being in the world's largest desert with students in classrooms half a world away by uploading photos and video clips of endlessly deep crevasses and, and these, these snowstorms that would kick up with these heavy winds that would be sort of the equivalent of a sandstorm in the Sahara Desert truly is an enlightening and inspiring thing and empowering thing for me. I love to be able to connect those, those classrooms. But I realized something on this expedition that for me would become the touch point or the reason why I do everything that I do now on expeditions. Students love exploration. Tens of thousands of students have connected with my expeditions over the years. How awesome would it be if we created a group of student explorers, taking them into the field where they would do the things that I do and they would be the ones peer to peer communicating the place, the adventure, what they're learning with classrooms all around the world. So with the help of my wife, Kathy, and my best friend, Bob, we created an organization called Impossible to Possible. And the goal, straightforward, take young people 16 to 21 years of age on free expeditions around the world, cost them nothing. We tie an educational program to that expedition and the mandate is simple. They got to run. They got to do their own adventure. They got to find a way to share the adventure. Well, of course, we give them all the tools. And they've got to connect this educational program to their trip. So to that end, we've done 15 expeditions all over the world. And seeing them do these things to me is, I just love it. It's really the passion for me. I'm a volunteer in this organization, but it's what I love the most. So this is a group of young people from all over the world that have come together. So you have First Nations youth, you have couple of kids, I think, from the U.S. on this one. And they're running across the world's largest expanse of salt, the Bolivian Altiplano, a place that's so flat, NASA has calibrated satellites from there. They're at a high altitude. They were at about a little over 3,000 meters of altitude, 10,000 feet to 11,000 feet, running across this salt. So remember, it's salt, not snow. And as they made their way, we partnered with educators on our team to teach a course, a curriculum about chemistry. It was in 2010 and it happened to be the International Year of Chemistry. So our youth ambassadors would collect minerals and each day new chemistry experiments from the minerals they would collect on their expedition would be used by our professors and connected to classrooms in experiments that would be conducted live to classrooms all around the world. And classrooms could therefore participate using their own elements and minerals that they would gather. 
So today we're doing similar things. We reinvent the way we teach every expedition as well. In 2010, we taught a curriculum of biodiversity and obviously the best place to go is the Amazon jungle. So this video is quite literally in the central Amazon jungle and you've got a group of youth ambassadors who have become field reporters answering students questions daily on what it was like to be in the most biodiverse region of the planet. The rainforest is pouring rain and exactly what I thought the rainforest would be. This has got to be the coolest day of my life. I'm just I'm on cloud, cloud nine right now. This is awesome. So you can imagine that's Jessie. She's 16 years old from Edson, Alberta. This is Sierra. This is the first time, you know, I think they were 17, 16, 17, 18 on this expedition. For starters, I'm a father of two daughters. I can't believe anybody let me take their kids into the Amazon jungle. That one I can't understand because let me tell you, that place is full of snakes and spiders. But we, no, we make the expeditions uh, safe. Most of the time they're very safe. And so we do the best that we can. I'm kidding. No, it's very safe. And so you can imagine being that age and you're sharing what you're learning about biodiversity. You're meeting people from a different culture that otherwise you would have never potentially connected with. And you're learning and that you can exceed any challenge that you think you might have for the rest of their lives. They'll know that, hey, when things get tough, I actually, I trekked through the Amazon jungle. I made it from one indigenous community to the next and help to create something awesome while doing it and sharing this, this expedition, I can get through this in my life. And so, you know, it's a big part of what we do with Impossible Possible is give young people the opportunity to go and learn about themselves, not just about their world. Whether it's in these photos that you see here, this is Tunisia running upwards of a marathon a day across the sands of the Sahara, learning the importance of water to the human body when running in the heat, but also the importance of water to the people of North Africa, and then challenging students in schools around the world to come together in a fundraising initiative to build water projects in North Africa. It's the ability for these young people on these expeditions to connect what they're doing to themselves and to schools. I think probably the question that I get the most often from these youth ambassadors when we're all on an expedition together, doesn't matter where we are, doesn't matter what the group is, we'll be sitting around a campfire and uh, if we're in a place that we can have a campfire and they'll always inevitably ask me the question, what is the longest run you've ever done? What's the hardest thing you've ever done? And I always say to them, it might seem like they're the same thing, right? Obviously the longest run, the hardest thing, but in fact, for me, they're two completely different things. I always tell them, can I tell you about the hardest thing first or the longest run first and the hardest thing later? And they, oh yeah, okay, what, what's the longest? I said, I once ran 7,500 kilometers across the Sahara Desert. And they look at me and they're like, yeah, right, sure you did. Yeah, I'm sure you ran. I said, oh, I'm serious, I really, I said, it don't, as a matter of fact, and I always have an iPad or something with me ready to show a film trailer. I said, as a matter of fact, a documentary film was made of this expedition. It was made by Matt Damon. So for sure, like, I mean, it's real. And you know what they always ask me? The first question they always ask, I say that and they say, who the heck is Matt Damon, right? So then I got to go through that whole explanation, right? I got to go through that. Anyhow, kidding aside, that makes some people laugh sometimes. I show them the trailer for Running This Hair and I'd like to show you the trailer now, if I might, for the next few minutes. Can I do that, Alex? Perfect, here we go. It is the most unforgiving place on earth. Over 3.5 million square miles, a vast wilderness. It is the Sahara Desert with people and cultures as unpredictable as the landscape. Running 50 miles a day, it's the challenge, it's going the distance, it's just pushing myself to my limits. It's never been done. No one's ever run that far in that period of time. That will be tough. It's a mental thing, I think. Imagine running 50 miles per day for more than 100 days in an unprecedented personal challenge. Three ultra runners, good friends, test physical strength and mental toughness running across the entire Sahara Desert. They're such high-end athletes. They're used to pushing themselves, but they're gonna be pushing their bodies more than they ever have in the past. We've had injury, we've had sickness. Sorry, dude. The best thing to do would be to stop for the day, but we have to cover some miles today. Any Americans found there without proper paperwork are gonna be considered spies. 
liable to execution. But we're going to have to make the best decision for us as a team. It's so difficult for me because the personalities are so different. I don't want to push us into the ground, obviously, but I'll push us damn close. This is, you know, a lot tougher than you could have ever thought. You can do this. You don't want to quit. It's okay. <laughs> we saw a young boy, seven or eight years old, in the desert alone, fending for himself while his dad was a two days walk away to get water. That's the water situation. I mean, it's so much bigger an issue than I would have ever thought. Narrated by executive producer Matt Damon and directed by James Mall, a personal and compelling journey into the world's most mysterious wilderness. The purpose of the three of us coming here was to learn more about each other to learn about the people of the Sahara and to do something that hasn't been done before. They all three agreed that if one runner went down, they would be out of the expedition. I thought your commitment was different than that. When is the end? The end is when we get to Cairo. It will be a life-changing experience, and not just for the three runners, for everybody who's along on this journey. Awesome. I hope that that video worked all right for you guys, and you were able to, you know, sort of watch it. But you can always go and find the trailer, um, obviously, on YouTube or elsewhere. But, you know, it basically... It, the, the film tells the story of the three of us, my buddies, Charlie, Kevin, and I, as we made our way 7,500 kilometers from the west coast of Africa to the east coast of Africa over the course of 111 days. We didn't take any days off, I mean, quite literally, and we ran an average of about 70 kilometers per day. Probably the most difficult part of the expedition was the two showers we had the entire time we were out there. You can see the last line on the slide. I mean, listen, it was really, it was physically a very difficult thing to do. And it was a really long way to go. And as I'm explaining this to these youth ambassadors that would be sitting around these campfires, I say to them, but, you know, as difficult as that expedition was, it wasn't as difficult as this transition or this change that I had in my life. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, well, when we reached the East Coast, of Africa in 2007, February, and our hands were above the water at the Red Sea. I stopped to think for a minute and Charlie's hand was there and Kevin's hand was there and my hand was there, all hands, all three of our hands, when they touched the water, it would be the end of the expedition. It would mean it was all over. And I remember looking at their hands and my hands and thinking, wow, I'm just the same as these guys. I ran all this way shoulder to shoulder with these guys and did exactly what they did, but they're like running legends. I mean, I quite literally started running, like serious running about three and a half years before that day that I reached the edge of the Red Sea. And uh, seven years before that, a little over seven years before that, I was a pack a day, sometimes two pack a day smoker, who was the furthest thing from being a professional runner. Yet, I did this thing with them. And these youth ambassadors, their eyes are huge by this point. They're like, what are you talking about? How's that possible? How did that happen? How do you, you must have did track or something growing up. I said, no, I really wasn't. I grew up on a farm, you know, a hobby farm. And my brother and I ran all over the place. But truly, nothing really changed for me in my life until I was reaching my late 20s. And I was no longer satisfied with being somebody who just didn't complete things. I didn't complete my education. I didn't really have any passion in my life. I was outwardly pretending to be a happy guy, inwardly a very unhappy person. And I was physically, obviously, when you're smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, you're not the healthiest person. And I knew that I wanted to change, but I just did not know how to make it happen. And I'm lucky I have a younger brother, John, and anybody that knows me and follows me knows that he's for sure my greatest inspiration. And through his own actions of becoming an athlete and a mountain biker and a paddler and a climber, I was inspired that he had so much and was finding so much life and passion in the outdoors. And I thought, wow, maybe if I did the things that he does, my life would be different, things would be different. And because we don't have enough time to go into it in great detail tonight, suffice to say 
that he inspired me and it was the most difficult thing I ever did was to quit smoking and follow in his footsteps and pursue the things that he was doing to change my life. The minute I finally decided to embrace that change, it took me about three years to quit smoking. Like it was the hardest thing I ever did. I've met people that say to me, big deal, I quit smoking in the day, it went so hard. I said, listen, the most difficult things that we do in our lives are relative to us. The greatest challenges that we face are relative to us. We can't really compare them to anyone else. And that has carried me through so many expeditions when things get difficult. And I say to myself, wow, I don't know if I'm gonna get this done. And then I have to remember, wait, this is difficult for me right now, but things can change, right? You can't compare it to any of the other trips and everything, anything else or anyone else that I know. So at any rate, I followed him into the outdoors and I started doing all the things that he was doing. And it led me from one activity to the next. I started racing mountain bikes. My life changed 180 degrees. And, you know, obviously the cigarettes behind me, I'm eating healthier. I was just discovering this whole new person that I did not know existed inside my body. And it was like life restarted at 30. By the time I was 35, I decided to take on my first full on running race, which was a hundred mile or 160 kilometer nonstop running race in the Yukon. And Trust me, to my shock and surprise, and to everyone that's watching here, not only did I finish this race, but I won this race. And I'd never won anything physical like this in my entire life. And I thought to myself, because I had entered the race almost on a whim, it was an article I read in a magazine that was talking about this amazing Yukon wilderness and this Arctic and this race that happens and these people and they go and do this thing. And I thought, who are these people that, that are so, you know, uh, strong willed and confident to go and try to run this distance. I could not believe that. And I'd done some amazing, crazy things by this point with my brother, like, you know, well, like, you know, tons of stuff, adventure racing and all sorts of things in these three years until I'm reading this article, I'd done a lot of stuff, but I'd never done anything like this or seen anything like this. And what compelled me to enter that race was a photo of runners that I saw that looked like they could be anyone that they were not these ultra ripped Uber athletes, but instead they were regular people trying to do something extraordinary. And in the process of maybe finishing the race, maybe not, they were learning something so amazing about themselves that it gave them the confidence to go back year after year. I mean, who are they? Just, I, can't, I couldn't believe it and do other races like it. So I knew I had to, I wanted to desperately know what they knew about themselves. And so this race, would be my first running race because of them and the inspiration of them. And I wanted to see what would happen. Again, a much longer story that is for another time that we don't have tonight, but I reached the finish line. And to my disbelief, this is, we're not talking about, uh, you know, 10,000 people at the Ottawa Marathon here. We're talking about 45 people or something. So everybody gets separated right away. And then you kind of don't really know where you are. And then you are, uh, you know, a sleep deprived zombie by the end of this thing. But Halfway through that race, I almost quit. I almost stopped. I almost went home. But something in me at the halfway point with me sitting out there on my yellow plastic sled that I bought at Walmart that was full of all the mandatory gear that you needed to have in this race, something inside me said, don't quit. The part of me that was saying, go home and what are you going to say to your friends when you know they all told you you shouldn't have done this thing in the first place and da, da, da. something inside me said, it's not about an adventure isn't about, and this adventure isn't about anyone else. It's about you in this moment. It's the decision that you made to go and do this thing. And the outcome, the only outcome that matters is the one that you create from it. And so I decided, as corny as it sounds, that was an epiphany for me. And I just said, oh my God, I'm just gonna go as far as I can. And I'll go into my breaking point. I know that I need to push myself harder than I ever have and anything else I've ever done. And even if I don't make it to the finish line, I'll go as far as I can I, and I'm gonna learn whatever it is that I came here to learn. Well, of course, I already told you the punchline. I reached not only the finish line, but was shocked to find out from the race director that not only did I finish, but that I'd actually won this race. And as I mentioned before, I'd never won anything in my entire life like this. And it felt so great to feel so strong and confident in that moment. I mean, I'm standing there, he's telling me that I won and all the pain is coming back into my legs. I don't even know how I did this thing. It's like, I willed all the pain away. 
I went into this different place. I got into what they call the zone. And then when it was all over, it all came crashing down again. But I wanted to know how I felt in that time of the race when I got off that sled and I kept pushing myself one step after another and got to that finish line. I wanted to know how did I do that? And I wanted to feel that great for the rest of my life. And I knew running would be the way that I would do that. And running would take me and become my greatest teacher around the world into other ultra marathons to try and recapture what it is that I did in the Yukon. I ended up doing numerous races in the Sahara Desert. The challenge of being in the desert in a place that was so inhospitable, in a place that was so difficult, um, learning again different things about myself, learning about different gear and what would work and what wouldn't, that after a while I really truly fell in love with this place. And of all the races that I would do, it was the ones that, in the, that were in the Sahara that I loved the most. That led me to this idea with my two friends of running across the entire Sahara Desert. And so we decided after coming together in ultra marathons that we would set the goal of running through six countries and make our way from West Coast of Africa to the East Coast of Africa. But if we were gonna do this thing, this huge expedition that would be way bigger than any ultra marathon that we ran, to this point, we would need the right person to be the leader of our team. This man here is Mohammed Iksa with Charlie, Kevin and I. He would lead our expedition and it was his camp where we would leave from every single day, bright and early in the morning. He would say to us, look guys, I'm gonna take care of you. And if you're gonna get this thing done and I'll never say how long it'll take you. If you're gonna get it done, you gotta do what I tell you. I will take care of you. My family will take care of you. The big film crew machine, they've got their own camp and I've got people taking care of them. We're separated, you're doing your own thing. You gotta wake up early in the morning, every single day. When it's still cool out, you run until noon, you crash for a few hours in the hottest part of the day and then you start running again until night. And that's how we've got to do this thing over and over and over again. We'll be out there to resupply you as you make your way. And of course, it's going to be physically grueling, but it's the things that we're going to learn and see along the way that would make it even more difficult. And by physical, I mean, it was physically difficult to do. I won't lie to you. I mean, it was a hard thing. You know, Charlie and Kevin and I all lost tons of weight in doing this expedition. I started the expedition weighing, going weight, my normal weight's about in pounds is about 151, 150 pounds. I went in at 165 pounds and finished the expedition at 119 pounds. So physically, obviously very difficult to run that distance, but it wasn't the physical aspect of the expedition that made it so difficult for the three of us. It was also the emotional aspect of the expedition. And what I mean by that was this almost daily lessons that we were getting as we ran through Mali and Mauritania and Niger, countries that, you know, from an economic perspective, we're way at the other end of the spectrum. And we'd be running through these communities where children would be playing outside and they would see us running and they'd say, oh my gosh, look, there's three bozos running through our town. Let's go for a run with these guys. And then all of a sudden you're surrounded by kids and they're just running with us. And they're saying all the same things that kids that I ran with all over North America and Europe and anywhere else, they all say the same thing. They're, you know, that's my mom. They'd be pointing, that's my that's my school over there. That's where I live. And, you know, there'd be kids telling you which they want to be when they grow up. It was just, it was just amazing to me how we are so much more similar than we are different in this world. And it was also the generosity of the people of North Africa that was just extraordinary. We would come into a community that quite literally was in the middle of the desert. I mean, you're talking a few hundred people in the middle of sand for hundreds of kilometers, right? And you roll in and the elders would insist that we stay because they're gonna feed us. The Sahara is a dangerous place and we're gonna feed you uh, meals, dinner. And we'd say, oh my gosh. And I, and I would like sheepishly, I'd be thinking to myself foolishly, like what are we gonna be eating? Or what can it possibly grow in the sand? I had some of the best tomatoes I ever had in my life growing in the sands of the Sahara desert. These people are agricultural geniuses. It's amazing how uh, they've made use of the resources that they have to grow an abundance of, of fruits, even though, or and, and vegetables, sorry, even though in grains, they have lack of access to what I have so readily available in my backyard in my own well, and that's clean drinking water. And it was that that made it 
sort of difficult. Here we are in this place running across the Sahara Desert and we have a filtration system. We have water, we're running every day. But Muhammad was teaching us about a people and a culture that have lack of access to something that I don't want to say I used to take for granted, but I sure didn't think about it in the same way that I did after this expedition. We would reach Agadez, one of the larger urban centers now in the center of the Sahara Desert in the country of Niger around Christmas time, 2006. And when we reached there, he said, you're going to see a byproduct of the water crisis of North Africa when we get to Agadez. So we arrive in Agadez. The first thing I saw, and then not necessarily in this photo, but where it was a camel market, which was going off like fireworks. There was tons of people and camels being sold. And they asked us, where are all these camels coming from? He said, do you remember those Tuareg nomads that you met in those races so long ago that you were doing, you told me you've seen Tuareg nomads. The nomads are the people who, you know, they pack salt on the backs of their camels and you'll see them, these long camel trains and they're nomadic people and they cross the Sahara Desert after they've mined the salt and they sell this salt. They recognize no borders. They just move across the Sahara Desert. He said, well, the nomadic peoples are disappearing. And I said, why? And he said, well, because they roll into those communities that no longer have a potable well or drinkable water. The community has disappeared. They have no water for their livestock, for themselves. And so therefore, all they want is a better lives for their friends, or sorry, for their family. And so they join their friends who have previously left for the city of Agadez to try and find that better life, that more stable life for their children. Incidentally, my wife, Kathy, that's her, you can see that my arms around her there. She would arrive in Agadez, they would do, they would take this risky flight and it was just this crazy thing to come and join us on the expedition for a week. And there we are with all of our friends and you can see that my arm was around her. That was after shower number one. I wasn't allowed to go anywhere near her until I had the very first shower because there was this wall of funkiness around me. I'll tell you, you'd be so stinky in the Sahara Desert on day 50, if you were in a sandstorm, you could smell your teammate and pretty much know within centimeters where they were. You didn't need to see them in the sandstorm. You just could smell. So these are photos that my wife, Kathy, took. Um, this is the side of the road in Agadez, and it gives you an idea of an overpopulation. This community cannot handle the number of people that were moving in. You do see traditional transport like this in, in the region of North Africa, but this is a truck. And this is an entire community uh, that we learned on this truck that had left a community that no longer had uh, drinkable water and they were headed, we're heading north, they're heading south to Agadez. We were heading north to Libya when this photo was taken. But even in the most dire of circumstances, you see the gentleman at the top waving and smiling as we ran by. I mean, this, this is what I'm talking about. The people were just so amazing and and it was just such a there was a spirit that was just incredible so kathy left the expedition after a week and she reiterated the words of my teammate charlie who said uh, at one point nobody's going to go and see a movie called running parts of the sahara desert and it was no longer about us being the first to cross the sahara desert or run across it was about sharing the stories of the people that we met along the way and about what we were learning about the water crisis of North Africa as we made our way. Of course, you know, we were even more motivated to make it to the end of the expedition. We crossed for weeks across sand dunes, seeing occasional piles of animal bones or human bones, a place so arid, a place so dry and hot that you can only survive literally hours without water. We crossed into Libya and had days and days of sandstorms where the sands would shift so quickly and so, and, and without any natural barriers, vehicles would be shifted and overnight at our camp would sometimes be tipped over. But at the same time, we found knife carving sites that were unearthed as the sands blew from the previous night at our camp, I'd see knife carving sites and arrowheads from when the Sahara was once this lush, green, amazing place. And we saw hide knives and we had this book of we had this huge, I can't remember who brought it, but we had this huge thick book of stone knives and arrowheads, et cetera. And we were actually identifying hide knives, you know, for, for uh, stripping hide of, of, of animals. 
from 10,000 years, 15,000 years old. I mean, it's amazing like to actually be looking at a book and we're comparing this stuff. So we reached the border of Libya and Egypt. And we knew at that point, Charlie, Kevin and I, that without doubt, we would make it eventually to the pyramids, that we would get to the Red Sea. There was this, this sense among the three of us that nothing could stop us. I learned it in my own decisions that I had made from the Yukon and from all of the ultra marathons after that, that this was not about us being some sort of superhumans being able to run across the Sahara, but that in each and every one of us, every human being has the capacity to be extraordinary if they choose to do so. And it was our choice. We were injured. We were sick. We, you know, it, but we knew if we had to crawl to get to those pyramids that we would, and we limped our way and made it there and then ran well over a hundred kilometers on our last day to reach the edge of the Red Sea on our day 111 of the expedition after leaving the pyramids that we would get to the Red Sea. And we're back to that point in the story with the youth ambassadors where I've got my hand above the Red Sea, the three of us, and I look at our hands and I think to myself, wow, our hands are the same. I'm the same as these guys. And our hands plunge into the water. And Kathy rejoined me at the edge of the Red Sea. And she said to me, what is it? What is the first thing that you thought of that came to your mind? And I said, you know what? The human beings have no limits to what we're capable of. And she said, what you? I said, no, we, human beings really. Adventure teaches us that. Being out there on the fringes of what our own adventures, challenging ourselves in ways that we never thought possible, teaches us that all of us can be extraordinary. It's not owned by one person. And I said, you know what I wanna do? I wanna take young people like this group you're looking at right now on their own versions of running the Sahara, on their own expeditions around the world where they can learn the things that I learned, taking the classroom outside, giving them an opportunity to see that in their own minds, they can be freed from all boundaries. And that's the end of my presentation. I'd love to take some questions from you. Wow, Ray, thank you so much. That <laughs> was just unbelievable. Um, I'm so inspired. <laughs> Those photos are incredible. Um, well, I could have on for I have so many stories about individual expeditions that I'd really love to share with people. But in the essence of, you know, not wanting people to fall asleep, I thought I would better, you know, tell you a couple. But I can answer all the questions that anyone has about any expeditions. For sure. And I just want to say, if you're if you're watching, um, we apologize for it looked like there was a bit of a YouTube outage there in the middle of Ray's talk. Um, you could probably still hear and see Ray's presentation, but if you weren't able to engage in the chat, um, we do apologize. I'm not sure what happened there, but thank you for sticking with us. And uh, if you have a question for Ray, please feel free to drop it in the chat. Angelica is monitoring and feeding me questions via text. Um, and before we get into it, I just want to say also that if you liked what you heard tonight, um, please consider making a donation to the Royal Canadian Geographical Society to help support our educational programming. Um, we do speaker series with amazing people like Ray. We support expeditions. We provide free resources to teachers all across Canada. Um, so if you are enjoying this kind of material and you want other people to have access to it, please do consider making that donation. You can donate right in the chat and Angelica can tell you uh, how exactly to do that. Um, or you can actually send an e-transfer to donations at rcgs.org. So donations at rcgs.org. Um, and we really, really appreciate your support. So now we'll get into some questions. So first up is from Thomas Carrier. And he wants to know, what's your main source of motivation when you're crossing a desert? Or I guess really some of these extreme environments, where are you at mentally? Well, you know what? I, the first thing is I approach every one of these expeditions with as humble an approach as I can and appreciate that I'm in a place that I am simply a visitor and that I'm very fortunate to be in. And I think to myself from that perspective, from that position, what is it that I can learn on this expedition? What is it that I'll see on this expedition that I really want to share with students who are following or whatever? And so ironically, I'm motivated to get that, to get to that next point where it might be something that students would really attach themselves to or really be excited about. 
because I get excited when other people are excited about adventure. I find that very motivating for me. So I think at the end of the day, it's not really about getting to the other side, although that's always in the back of my mind. It's more about those smaller pieces of the expedition, the days that make it so amazing, like communicating with a group of students about something that happened that day. That's what motivates me. Cool. Um, greener Adventures, who I think are actually, uh, if, I seem, if I'm remembering correctly, they're a husband and wife team of expeditioners who are based out of Nova Scotia. They want to know, um, have you ever had an expedition planned that never started? Uh, yeah, this October 2020, I was supposed to be starting probably the most difficult expedition of my career. I've done, I can't even remember, 17 expeditions around the world, not including 15 youth expeditions. So over 30 expeditions. And this was for sure the most difficult thing that I had taken on, but it's been postponed a year due to COVID, obviously. And um, so that's just one example. These things happen, but you know what? You got to roll with it. And, and it's, um, we're in a time where um, it, it, is a, it is a difficult time for everyone, but at the same time, I have such tremendous enthusiasm and hope with, in belief in people that I think that it's going to shift the way we think about each other. So if the price to pay for me on a personal level is my expedition is postponed, then that's a small, that's a small thing. It'll happen someday. <laughs> that's great. Well, we'll look forward to many more adventures to come and many more amazing stories. Um, so Aaron Kiley, who you know as uh, yeah. our editor-in-chief, he wants to know what's the scariest thing that you've ever encountered on an expedition? Well, the scariest thing I've ever encountered on an expedition, that would have to be, hmm, good question, Aaron. Let me think. Wow. Well, you know, in 2017, I broke through a river and almost died up in the Arctic. So that was pretty scary. Um, it was terrifying, actually, because I don't, I was in swift current water and I was almost washed all the way down a series of rapids and small waterfalls that I climbed up to. So that was pretty scary. I've been chased by wild boars on two different continents. That's pretty scary when a uh, you know, basically like a pig with spikes coming out of his face is chasing you. It's pretty terrifying, you know? <laughs> yeah, those, those sound pretty scary. Um, okay, Michaela wants to know um, how you dealt with heat exhaustion on your desert expeditions. Well, so, so I actually function, I do a lot of Arctic expeditions, obviously in cold weather expeditions, but I function really well in the heat. Heat is just a, I just, I'm, I'm, I love heat. I love being in the heat. And I have been really on the razor's edge in the heat though as well, being through Death Valley on the north south in 2011 through Death Valley or crossing the Namib or the Atacama deserts, for example, they were incredibly hot deserts. And I have been so chronically dehydrated. I can't even tell you my entire body is cramping, but I mitigate Every time the last project I did west to east through Death Valley, I had my sodium levels super high. I was constantly hydrating, um, you know, and that helps tremendously to stave off the, you know, the, the effects of dehydration. That's the thing. It's, it's more about the sodium, the minerals that you're taking in than the exact amount of water that you're drinking. Hmm. Okay, I'm really happy that someone asked this next question, especially after you mentioned that, you know, the rubber was breaking off your shoes in Death Valley. Um, Katya wants to know, how many pairs of shoes do you go through on one of those hot expeditions? Well, depending on, depending on the location and the expedition. So running the Sahara, we each went through approximately 20 pairs of shoes. And then um, in some of my other trips, like Namibia, I think I went through four pairs of running shoes in the Namib desert. So it all depends on the desert and the terrain. Death Valley, let me tell you. So both of those trips were really fast and light. Like the west to east, we did nonstop. There was nothing left of my shoes. They were just completely like disintegrated by the, just hanging on by threads basically. So it all depends on the terrain, but Death Valley has to be the middle of Death Valley through that salt 
is just unbelievable. And muck, it's a lot of water in the middle of Death Valley that people don't even know. There's a huge body of water, a salt marsh in the middle of Death Valley. So everything gets wet, dry, wet, dry, and it's salty. So I guess that actually leads me to uh, a follow-up question that I have, which is how do you take care of your feet <laughs> when you're getting your feet wet and you're going through well, these really raggedy shoes? And So I have conditioned myself over time that on the desert expeditions, I don't even wear socks anymore. Like I just wear my feet in my shoes, that's it. And I prefer that in the hot weather expeditions to go without socks. On the colder expeditions, obviously, I wear a really thin merino layer. So my goal is always keep my feet as dry as I possibly can. And then that lessens the chance of blisters. And then I use a product called Trail Toes, which is like an anti-friction product. And I use that on my feet and in my running shoes. And that helps to stop, you know, the potential of any blisters. And that's my system. And you know what? It works. The trick is you got to do one of two things. Keep junk from getting in your shoes at all or let all the junk in and hope it all goes out again. Those are the two keys. So in an environment where I know I'm gonna be getting soakers per se, and it's also gonna be silty and sandy, I prefer let it all in, let it all come back out of a meshy shoe. My feet will dry quicker. I can always stop, empty out my shoes, shake them out, whatever, and keep on trucking. In, you know, if I'm in a desert where there's a really fine powdery sand, I create like a shield over my shoes. I glue ripstop over the front of my shoes. People can find a video about this. It's somewhere on my Facebook page. And I give step, step by step how to do it. It doesn't weigh anything and the shoe still breathes, but it creates a barrier so that that's, uh, you know, little bits of sand can't get in and they use a really lightweight gator on top. Cool. Well, there you go. All of you runners watching at home, that's the the Ray Zahab patented method of taking care of your feet <laughs> in wow. all kinds of weather. Uh, so Kim wants to know what other parts of the world you want to explore? Well, there's a lot of parts of the world. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag on some of the trips I'm doing because I have, the, like, I'm sort of superstitious. I don't like saying where my next trip is going to be because then I, if I put it out there and it doesn't happen, then I feel, you know, like a tool for saying I was going to go somewhere. And then I, you know, so there's a lot of parts of the world. Look, I never tire of being in the Canadian Arctic. It's just such a beautiful place. And I do have numerous trips still planned up there. I love being there. I have a lot of friends there. And so it's just a place I love to visit. But I as well love Death Valley. And I love, um, you know, the other large deserts on the planet. I've as well started guiding uh, people on expeditions with my business, Capic One. And we're taking people back to some of the places that I've been obviously on shorter trips for a week at a time to explore some of these regions. So I get to sort of go back, you know what I mean? And see people that I've made such, in the Atacama Desert, I've been back to Chile 12 times. I, mean, I just love that place and I love the desert and I have a lot of friends there. So now going back there and getting able to share some of that with people as well is an amazing experience. Wow, uh, do you have plans to go back to the Sahara? Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. Someday I would love to go back to Niger. It's one of my favorite countries that I've ever visited was Niger. It's just amazing. The people, everything, the culture, it's just an amazing place. Okay. Oh, I love this next question. This is from David. He wants to know, is the North Pole on your bucket list? And do you worry that climate change could affect your ability to visit these extreme environments in the future? Well, I'll start with the climate. North Pole on the bucket list. I, okay, so yeah, I'd love to. I mean, that would definitely be a place, but there's so many other projects in the Canadian Arctic that I really want to dial in on. I have a really big Canadian Arctic project planned for next February. Don't want to say anything about it, but I'm with a couple of really good friends and I'm very excited about that. Um, climate change, you know, when we attempted to cross Kamchatka in winter, February 20. 19 I did that when that I showed that photo at the beginning of Stefano and I going over those mountains the expedition was stopped short after that mountain range because one side of the mountain range it's 40 below the other side of the mountain range spring had come in February it was plus three rivers were running and we were stopped literally 150 kilometers from reaching the east coast of Kamchatka less than that a straight line we were so bummed but hunters in the region told us they said we've never seen a winter like this 
things are changing. We've never seen anything like this. So for sure, climate change has an impact. There is no doubt about it. Um, I'm seeing it in a lot of the places that I go and I'm learning more about it from the people that live in these places that I go. Wow. So speaking of the Arctic, this is another technical running question from Drake. Uh, when running in the Arctic, how do you regulate your body temperature? Well, as my youngest daughter, Annika, as always said, and my oldest daughter, Mia, who are probably watching this right now, have always told me, it's only as cold as you dress and you can always take the layers off, right? So I learned that from that. You know, it's amazing. You know, I, I bring what I need and I and I sort of got it, you know, this January, I did a project up in, from Kikik Tarjwak to the Pangertong Fjord. I went across that little section of frozen sea ice, like that Davis Strait section. And, um, it was incredibly cold in January in that region of the Arctic, but the layering system that I had, Canada Goose creates some amazing stuff for me. It just worked really well. It's all about the layering and knowing the layers that'll work for you. And you know what? Another thing that runners have been saying forever, and, and it's kind of true, you dress for five degrees or whatever colder, right? Did I say that right? You know what I mean? Like you go a little bit with less clothing because you're going to warm yourself up when you're really trucking along. So, you know, you don't want to sweat. That's the big thing. Don't sweat because you can't dry yourself out when you're up there. You go and roll into camp with a wet base layer. It's not drying. And I don't change my base layers on Arctic expeditions. As funky as it gets, I do not change the base layer. Self pole, I wore the same base layer for 30 days. At the end, that base layer walked away on its own, right? Like, but you know, you don't change that. You go with that one base layer. <laughs> Is there anything that you bring with you on every single trip, no matter what? That's a, a question from Justine from the chat. Yeah, you know what? I bring a photo of photos of my family um, with me on every expedition and notes from my daughters. Um, and my wife, Kathy, so they'll give me notes and I, they, they hide them in my bags. And also there's an interesting character that comes with me on all my expeditions. My daughters have a little monkey, we call him Mr. Monkey, he's a stuffed monkey. And he goes on all the expeditions. They let me, Annika and Mia let me bring him because he's the connection point for younger schools. So thankfully, John, you know, the famous John, the photographer from John Golden, from all the photos that you've seen tonight. John takes Mr. Monkey on all these adventures and he's been, I don't even know how John makes these things happen. I mean, where that monkey has been, it's crazy. He's been in helicopters, he's been, you know, in police cars, he's been everywhere all over this world. And so he connects to younger audiences, the stories of the places we go. So it's very important that Mr. Monkey goes on every expedition. <laughs> oh, that's really sweet. Um, one final question, which kind of comes from uh, Angelica and I, because we obviously can see from your presentation that you're not a person who likes to sit still for too long. Yeah. So how are you coping with this COVID related isolation? How are you, you know, keeping your sanity and staying fit and thinking ahead to your future adventures? Well, you know, I, I've talked a lot about this actually through social media and stuff like that. And I've been doing these Facebook lives every Saturday. The reality is, Alex, I mean, I honestly, I think we fear the uncertainty more than, I mean, obviously nobody wants to get COVID. Lives are being lost. It's a horrible um, virus. But we all, I think, fear the uncertainty more than even the virus. Like, am I going to get the virus? Am I going to have a job? Am I going to, are my kids ever going back to school? Um, will life ever be the same? And I think that uncertainty is a huge fear for everyone. And, you know, <clears throat> I had a great year last year. This year started out with barely any income. My expedition's canceled. I, I'm a race director here in uh, Gatineau Park where I live. Um, my teammates and I who host these races, we had to cancel the first, um, second and third races of the year. So much uncertainty and I could lose a lot of sleep over it. I mean, I, mean, I, I really could. I got good reason not to sleep at night. But I thought about it and I thought to myself, well, this is a lot like an expedition and it's getting through each day, one day at a time. Because eventually we know we will come out the other end of this. We'll come out different, but we'll come out the other end of this. And it's kind of like the old, you don't eat an elephant in one sitting. 
you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? So we've got to get through one day at a time. And I've chosen to, and I can't help, you got to look at, or I choose to look at the glass half full. That, you know, I'm spending more time with my family, my daughters. Kathy and I do these runs every day with our girls. We're out on the trail. We do. We are very fortunate to live in the area that we live. We live in an area where there is a little bit of trails right behind our house. We can get out there. Um, you know, we live in the countryside, so we've, we've got that. We're, we're identifying every day the things that we're grateful for. And top of that list is that we're spending more time together as a family and with our kids, even though we do adventures together as a family and stuff together. Now it's like every single day. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but even like when the kids are going back to school, like we're not sending them back. We just like, this is like extended summer holidays for them. Not, it, but that's not what it is. But I'm saying the spending the time together has been really awesome even when they're going off the rails and losing it, it's still worth it, you know? Mm -hmm. Got to cherish the time that we have with the, our closest loved ones. Yeah, every night that I go to sleep, I identify three things that during the day, no matter how small or insignificant they might seem, the three bright spots in every day. And I think that that's what sets you up for the next day. Like my coffee brew was perfect this morning. You know what I mean? Like that's something to be thankful for, right? And in, in these days of COVID. So you got to take the good where you can get it. Well, I love that. Thank you so much. So, and thank you just for being here with us tonight, Ray. That was amazing. It was so inspiring. Um, everyone at home, I hope you enjoyed that talk. Um, if you tuned in late or missed something, uh, you can go back and find it on our YouTube channel. It'll be up tomorrow morning. Um, and do take advantage of that subscription promo. So remember it's cangio.ca slash subscribe promo code RayZ30 to get your subscription to Canadian Geographic. And hopefully we'll see some of you on Twitter tomorrow for our live Q and A with Mark Cullen, the gardening expert. So thanks again, everyone. Have an amazing night and we'll see you again soon. Thank you everyone.